put it down your drain for Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not going to be harmful, no. Uh, no, it won't. No, no okay. it's not toxic to anything. No, the lime, it, it's, other than the fact that it'll burn you, it's... it's it, 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 yeah. It, it's, yeah. It, yeah. And that's the pH in it. It's actually, a, I mean, people yeah, spread it on their fields all the time. In fact, lime, um, one of the huge uses of lime that is unknown is in water purification. It's a huge use yep. of lime. That's right. It's in the, so. And in drinking water purification. I mean, literally, they use lime to purify our drinking water. It's incredibly healthy. Yep. Because it kills everything. It kills molds and mildews and botulism. And then, I mean, it, it literally kills everything. And of course, in Europe, during the bubonic plague, when they tried to control it, when they had so many people dying, they, they dig their maths graves in Europe, put the bodies in, and then put lime on the top, and the lime killed the plague virus. So that's how they managed to keep it under control. You know, I, it's... If you walk in a house that has lime plaster walls, and, and all the lime plaster walls have been painted with latex paint, you've lost any value that the lime plaster has given you. Yeah. Um, because it's, it's covered with an impervious. Lime plasters are never meant to be painted with modern latex paint. You can lime wash them, um, and then you can color the plasters. You can do frescoes. You can do all that kind of stick. But don't plaster something and then put latex paint on it. You've totally defeated the whole process. People send me pictures and email me and text me pictures all the time. I got an old, lot, old house that has plaster coming off and da-da-da-da, and I look at the picture, and there's, you know, paint spots here, and there's paint spots here, and there's paint spots here. I said, well, okay, great, but what are you going to do when you're done? Well, I'm going to paint it. I just want to make sure I use the right material. I said, then just use gypsum. Yep. If there's absolutely no sense using this if you're going to paint latex paint over everything. It has to be exposed. Um, but you walk in a house that has lime plaster that's been 100% exposed, it's healthier. You can smell the difference. It's huge. It kills molds and mildews. It's insane. Answer your question about the, the difference between gypsum um, and, um, and and lime. I, it, people will boast and say, "I carry four uh, dumpster loads of of horsehair plaster out of my house. Got rid of it." Well, what do you put in? Oh, he said, "I'm we're drywalling the whole thing. You put a piece of drywall outside overnight and it falls apart in the rain, and you're replacing a material that lasts 150 years with a piece of drywall that falls apart in the rain. So you guys are." What are you doing? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You can actually take the old plaster. I mean, if um, whoever's do, um, Brighton, if he can, and whoever's running the project here, you can save all this old lime plaster. There's no, if there's no um, lead paint in it, which you basically would have to strip the lead paint, you can take all that old horsehair plaster and put it in what they call a roller pan mixer mix it around, put fresh lime on it, and put it right back on the wall again. It's 100% recyclable. The aggregate's already right, it already has lime in it. Why fill a landfill or a hole in the ground with plaster when it's perfectly good? Just recycle it, put fresh lime in it, and put it right back on the wall yep. again. The wood, wood framed wall, they're always, they always have wood lath. Yes, it needs to go on wood lath. Um, if you're putting it on masonry, it will adhere directly to the masonry. If you're putting on wood lath, you have to use horsehair. If you're putting it on um, masonry, you don't necessarily need the horsehair. Depends on the condition of the masonry, basically. But generally, horsehair has is only used on wood lath. Yeah. The, the idea is to keep it as simple as possible. Lime wash. You just need a bucket. I mean, that that bucket, five gallon bucket of lime putty will make. 25 gallons of lime 25 wash. gallons of lime wash, which means you can paint your entire house for it at least, you know, twice, if you want, you know, and it will cost you what that, I mean, it, it does, it, it's, and a little bit of casing to stop it from dusting off, because it, if you don't put something like a casing yeah. binder in it, or when you lean against it, you'll have a white hole, so you have to put something in to stop it from dusting, you know, that, it, but it's that simple. You know, it's that, some water, pigment, if you want to put pigment in it, and some casein to stop it from dusting. And, and casein is basically a, uh, a protein. It's a protein. So you basically can take um, bull's blood and put it in and make a red lime wash out of it because blood is, is, has protein in it. So yep. you basically just ex start experimenting with stuff that you got and make your own. Yeah. 
try so, milk. So you can't. Yeah, you, you won't find a better lime, but you can add all types of stuff to it and make whatever you want. Dried milk from Walmart. Dried milk from Walmart. Yeah, I I've, I've tried that and it works fine. Make it red. That's Great right. Yeah. So. So um, one of the things to look out for when you're working is don't get lime down between your your glove and your hand and if you feel the pain you need to stop um, and take care of it and really everybody should carry some um, white vinegar white vinegar is on the opposite of the ph scale and will neutralize the lime um, i i have a tendency to work through pain so the one time i was mixing and we were working and i went in for lunch and i had this pain and literally by the time i got to lunch i had all these scars here blood was just running off my hand um it, it, so it, it is something that you need to pay attention to and the reason i said that is because the plaster never comes with hair in it because the high ph often people will say no wait i wanted a hair plaster why don't you sell it with hair in it the high ph of the lime will eat the hair so you have to add it right before you put it in so that's i'll let you take over but i just wanted to yeah that's right. say that that's, that's important so this is the, this is the base material this is for what we're doing basically this lime putty is in there in that bucket there what you can see with the drill in it but with sand in it aggregate so if anybody wants to come and have it play with that please come and use the trowel and just feel it and see gloves here if anybody wants to have a pair of gloves so. yeah. is there a way if, if so if your you know lime has been you know too hot if it's if the tea has been too hot is there a way that you you could as a consumer you could tell if something is selling you slate lime is there like anything to look for that would say this is probably not good the right lime to use I, that's a really good question. No one's asked me that before. How do you know if the lime has gotten too hot? I'm not sure. Um, uh, we guarantee that ours is not. Um, one of the, I mean, this, the pH, there's a couple characteristics that a good lime putty has. Um, and I didn't give, you know, our PowerPoint goes into all the details of them, but um, the high pH is 12.4. Actually, it's 12.45. It's very, very high. Basically, you could take, if we had a dry hydrate, um, you could put it on a, a dead cow, and in a year it would be dissolved. I mean, it just, it literally just it will dissolve into bodies, and it would just, it's crazy. Um, it needs to have a high surface area. We have pictures on the PowerPoint. The typical Type S lime, and most limes that you find, um, basically are large pieces, and they're, they're um, very rounded. Um, when you look at ours under the microscope, um, it has a surface area with basically it looks like a very, very um, uh, rough sponge. So there's nooks and crannies and caves. It looks like the roughest surface you ever met because it has a huge surface area, which means it actually will absorb more water, which is what you need for a good, for a good working lime, for lime plasters and lime mortar. You need a good, huge surface area. And that's one of the things about when you're slaking your own mix, um, and it gets too hot, you lose the surface area and it doesn't carry on the water as well. I've had people tell me, hey, I use Type S Lime from the local masonry supply store, or local feed so store, and I disagree with you because I, I put it on 15 years ago and I've not had any issues with it. I totally would say to them, then what is the main binder in that mix is actually a clay. The clay is actually providing the binding, it's not actually the lime. The lime may be helping, but um, somewhat. But basically, the Type S lime is giving workability to the mix, but it's not acting as a sole binder. So you need a high, a high calcium content. We talk about knocking up. I'm taking over from you, Richard. I'm yep, sorry. that's all right. But Keep going. The term knocked up, it came from the masonry trade because the high cal pure calcium actually conducts electricity. And masons of old would have a hunk of wood or something and they would pound their mortar. They would not, it's called knocked up, and it becomes amazingly workable. Um, and so our, our, um, our calcium content is, is, is very, very, very high in our, in our lime. Um, and it basically, the workability of it sticking on your tools is out of this world. Um, you can get it to stick on your slicker inch and a half, two inches. Um, whereas if you use a type S lime or a different type of lime, so you'll know when you start working with it pretty quickly. Um, so when you first, we have a little video on the website, it's me standing there talking about this, but when you first open up the bucket, before you knock it up, and you take your trowel and put in there and pull it out, 
you will say a bad word because it's going to feel like wet beach sand. It's yep. not going to be workable. It's going to, it's literally just going to crumble. It's going to be bad until you understand that it has to get pounded or knocked up. So we use a big giant egg beater type mixer on the end of a drill. Um, and it basically, you're not mixing the different ingredients in the, in the pre-mixed buckets. We're not mixing different ingredients. You're basically pounding it and you're knocking it up. And what it's doing is it's energizing the high calcium content in there. And then it becomes really, really workable. So if you, if you don't knock it up, you're going to say a bad word. Um, it, it's not going to be workable. Once it's knocked up, you put it on your hawk. You, you're literally, it sticks to your hawk so well, you can hardly even push it off. It's, it's so tenaciously, it, it just wants to cling to everything. And that's the high calcium content. So one of your questions about the different characteristics of different, different types of lime, a lot of it is, is experience. You'll know right away, hey, this is not a good lime. This is not going to work. Lime plaster. The, the lime putty is what, uh, the binder is what John said, binder which, which what triggered me. It is a misnomer really for lime because a binder is more of a gypsum. Gypsum glues everything together with a chemical set. So once you add water, the gypsum starts a reaction, gets a little bit warm and glues everything together. So, there's, so it actually has to touch everything together. Lime, because you're working with a lime putty, it's actually a buffer material. It keeps everything, it fills the voids and keeps everything away. So, and that's why when you work lime plaster, you generally have to rub it back to compress it, because if you don't, it, it isn't solid enough. It'll actually start to fall apart. So when we start lime plastering, we'll go through that. So. One of the questions that people have is, if I'm plastering a whole entire house and I have 15 plasters in the house. How am I going to, they didn't have drills back then. They didn't have this kind of stuff. How are you efficiently knocking up the mortar? Um, and basically you would do is take the, the buckets of mortar and put them in a, a, a mixer and it would knock, knock up large amounts at a time. Yeah. And then you, then you can put it, or you can just do it in the bucket, but yep. um, you can have one guy just mixing it all up. But if you, dump these into a big vertical shaft mixer, one that stirs, doesn't lift um, because it's so heavy, it's such a heavy material. These are one of the, some of the heaviest buckets you'll ever lift actually, they're, um, how, how because much, they're so compact. How much of a wall will one of these buckets cover? I mean, how you'll get about, on lath, you'll get about 12 to 15 square feet per five gallon bucket, per coat. Okay. So. And what do they run? What do they cost to get a bucket like this that's already pre-mixed? Um, sand and the other. They, they're about fifty dollars a bucket. Okay. Yeah. But we, I always, I have to say, a little cheat here as a commercial contractor. I rarely use these these mixes apart from the top coat, the finish coat. Mm -hmm. When we're mixing up base coat, we like to use a big mixer yeah. and batch mix it so that we will basically take whatever material we have we'll mix it all together through the mixer and then yeah. either put it back into the, the tubs the buckets to transport to where we're going or just keep knocking it up as we this is what they call a right angle drill so the motor is actually here and then it's it's geared down so you get a, a lot more torque out of it but if you use a regular straight like hole shooter type you'll burn the drill out because it's stuff is so thick yeah this stuff's so dense that if you don't get that weight to compress it it doesn't mix properly and the more it's mixed the actual more you move it the better it becomes so when I start showing you actually how to plaster you'll see that I'm constantly moving the material on my hawk even when I'm talking to people just to keep it moving to keep that to get it what we call in the trade in the plaster trade to get it to fatten up so the fat is the actual lime putty and it just makes sure you coat every single grain of the of the of the aggregate. So I'm going to give this a. If you don't, if you had no idea what you were looking at, and you get one of these, and you and you just put your trowel in and say, "Oh, I'm going to I'm going to plaster with that." <laughs> There'll be 
You're going to say a bad word. Mr. Owens. Uh, You're going to hate line I, order. I have no idea what you've sent me. Yeah, well, I don't know what you've sent me, but it, it's, like, it's like the mud pan, you know? It's like the stuff that you, what's this? And then John will say, well, you're supposed to mix it. So it starts out like that, which looking at that and looking at what we're going to have in a minute is two different worlds. And, you know, don't be surprised when you open that tub up and you get your trowel in it like that and go, what did he just send me? That's exactly the number one challenge for, for us as Lancaster Lime Works is education. It's a yeah. huge challenge, but it's absolutely vital to understand these basics. Otherwise, you're going to be frustrated like crazy. Yep. So we've been we've been mixing this a little bit, maybe five minutes before we started the whole thing this morning. I've just given it another given it another go. You can see that it's already starting to look a little bit different. So it's starting to come together a little bit more. I think you'd add more water to it. Yeah, I will in a minute. I'm just going to make sure that. So you're right, it does, I think, needs a little bit more water. The strange thing is, when I started this 30 years ago, I started working with an old fella. He would buy, we, we used to buy the material, well, we, we'd make material from lime putty. There was no pre-mixed material in the UK 30 years ago. So they'd buy the lime putty, put the sand in, and he would not allow anybody to add any water to that mix. Because he wouldn't allow anybody to add any more water to the mix. To the to the plaster because he was taught as an apprentice that the lime putty carries enough moisture to make the plaster workable which in 30 years i've rarely found that to be true so i think he was an apprentice somebody was winding him up so if you feel that it needs more water go for it i think this at the moment i would <coughs> I would say that that, if you had any repointing or anything that you wanted to do on the outside, anything for a masonry, that is good enough to paint to point with. You don't want any wetter than that because it's going to stain the masonry. If anything, you could use it drier, but you know that's good enough for working masonry outside, but not for plastering. So the other thing is, in 30 years of working, you know this whole. There'll be a people who are purists saying, oh, you can only use filtered water from Switzerland to put in the plaster. And, you know, the cows have to be grass fed before they, you know, to cut the hair. On, and I'm like, actually, I worked on a lot of medieval buildings. I've worked on a lot of Roman buildings. I cannot tell you the stuff that I found in the plaster, in the walls, eggs, skeletons, branches, leaves, grass, <laughs> mm -hmm. people, you know well just like us they were like i've got a job to do i've got the material i can't spend time cleaning out every little tiny bit i'm just going to do it you know it's kind of crazy so i gently add the water i don't just pour a whole load of water in and and think that it's going to be right even now almost every time i mix every pail of plaster i'll judge it individually on each pail because you that the aggregate itself holds different levels of water. It's not the putty that's holding the water, it's the aggregate that's holding the water, because the putty just absorbs enough water to become putty and then pushes it out, which is why you always get water on the top of lime putty. So I take it, this is a, <coughs> a so gentle... You know, um, I, I know this is when you guys open it, but you pour the water off that's so you have control yeah I would normally I, this is the same water that we've mm -hmm. poured off so I would just use this water I'd pour it off and then re-add it but because I don't know whether because I don't know I didn't see the stuff going in the pail I don't know whether it was right or wrong when it went into the pail so I pour off the it, there'll always be water because that's the putty pushing the water out it just doesn't want it'll only hold enough to make keep itself in stasis so when I add the water back again, I add it incrementally to make sure that we don't um, over water it. It's easier to yep. add water than to take it out. It's easier to take it, it's easier, but if you do put too much water in it, it's not a big deal. Yeah. 
the water will work its way to the surface, yeah. but it could take a couple weeks. So if time is on your side and it's too wet, basically leave the leave the lid off. It'll begin to dry. This is this was damper way uh, two hours ago. Yeah. But we got a dry humidity right now. I can feel it in my throat, yeah. and um, the sun is hitting. It's in direct sun, so it's actually drying as it's sitting there. And the beautiful yeah. thing about lime putty is you can keep on adding water to it. Yep. It, it, it's it's fine. It's, it's yeah. The way I judge it, it's like a cake mix for me. When what I find is that, is that when it starts to fold over on itself smoothly and leave just a nice little fold in the actual material, this is not quite there, that's when it's ready. The, you may have to add some more water after you add the hair because the hair may absorb, but we'll, we'll come to that in a bit. So, see, it's starting to kind of hold itself together. It's, I think maybe it's other than that, adding some more hair to that one, I would probably, I'm going to mix it more now because if I overwater it, like John said, then I have to wait. So. If you're doing stucco work, if you were putting plaster outside, I would use that as it is. For the base coats for the two base coats you'd always do you don't always have to do three coats but good practice is three coats so i would just wouldn't add anything to that make sure your masonry is clean dust free damp the masonry down make sure we, we aren't going to do any here because there isn't any stucco but <clears throat> if there's portland in the joints if they've been you know doing anything like that if there's anything horrible in there get that out clean the dust out with a brush wash down the wall <clears throat> before you stock out spray the bricks and the joints and then just start troweling it on but it's the same technique to trowel it on as it will be when we start doing the plaster upstairs so um, what i'm going to do is show you how to beat it up on the board by hand if you're feeling really brave so we're going to do a little bit on here but it's actually surprisingly quick it, sometimes quicker to take it out of the bucket do it in batches on a board than it is to try it because that's a big volume of material to try and this is my homemade bucket trowel which basically yeah i just got an angle grinder and cut the end off it's surprisingly difficult it shows how <coughs> few real tradesmen there are in the world because when i <clears throat> when I first started, I had a broom and a bucket trowel because my trade master said, you're only going to be brushing up, you're going to be you know, after me, and you're going to be taking the mortar out of the pail or the wheelbarrow or the mixer and giving it to me for two years. <clears throat> so that's the only tools you're going to need. And I was like, OK, fair enough. When the, you know. So... <clears throat> rather than trying to find one somewhere did what happens is i find when you buy them you i don't like it. bond do one but they do it and they've actually spot welded the spigot ah. onto the blade and this stuff's so dense you do that and then there's a ping and you end up with a handle with a spike on it and your blade stuck in the plaster so now what i've done it's the way I was taught. If you're using a spot board, basically this is just one of those two by two sheets you can get from Home Depot. They're about 15 bucks. I don't cut my own or anything. I just go and get them. This spot board, you probably a bit more difficult mortar board. They do sell them. You can find them if you really need them. I find them really, really useful. And I've, I was always taught with any line work, strangely enough, water is the key. You always use water. Your, keep the material fresh by covering it with water when it's on the wall you're waiting for the water to come out of it but while you're waiting for the water to come out of it you're walking up to it and spraying it with water to stop it from going off too quickly so it's it's a trade of contradictions it's kind of strange so and you can see how friable it is coming out of the bucket you know it doesn't look anything like that so. please don't phone your supplier angrily because 
He'll tell you to read the instructions. If you let it sit in the bucket for two years, three years, I've already let it sit the longest, about six years, um, pull it out. The sand is so sharp and has such a wide variety of particle sizes in there, it's, it's basically the ideal sand for it. It almost feels like it's concrete when you go down in the bucket. Yeah. Almost it, you can't get it out. And it hasn't set one single bit. But it's just the sand becomes probably just from earth vibrations. I don't know what. If the sand just keeps on settling and it gets more interlocked, more sharp, um, and you'll get in there and be like, this is as hard as concrete. So yep. that's why we try to move the stuff through pretty quick. Otherwise, you know, like I can't even get the heater in there. Um, but if you do store it in the basement for 10 years and you come back, it's perfectly good. It's just the sand is going to be compact and it's going to it's going to have a different look than this altogether. So you're, you're basically just have to knock it up even more. This has been this was made probably a week, two weeks ago. So okay. It was just knocked up not long ago. I the bucket trowel now comes into its own because not only is it good for buckets, but it's good for knocking up applying plaster. And the way I do it, it's a good workout. If you want to keep fit, you can plaster your house and get exercise. I that we always turn it over onto itself and mix it through like this. Just like, like mixing some sort of strange pizza dough, I guess, kind of. And you can see that it pretty quickly it's coming together to be a usable material. It's astounding really when you think that when you pulled it out of the bucket you thought it was never going to be any good and within a couple of minutes you've actually got something that you could put on the wall so so who's going to come and give it a go the whole point of putting hair in is when you're doing lath and plaster to, to the thing that holds the plaster onto the wall is the is the curl, the, 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 the rib behind. So if you don't put any fibre in it, any hair in it, it breaks off immediately. So you've got, if it doesn't curl and stay curled, attached to the main part of the plaster, you've got to fail. Is lath the only like, framework that you use? You can use metal lath. Like, the metal lath, expanded lath. The only problem is because it's so caustic, <laughs> if it's zinc, it has a tendency to react. And if, if, you, if it stays wet for too long, it starts to rust out. And then after a year or 16, you know, 16, 18 months, you start to get these brown patches come through on the surface, which is basically the rust coming through. You could use stainless steel but so, for stainless steel is pretty much more expensive than using wooden lath. Yeah. Whereas, you know, the metal lath is the cheapest, but metal lath is generally used with gypsum plasters because it was part of the system. Is there a moment where people, they introduced metal lath and they hadn't yet figured out that they needed to change the recipe of the plaster? The, the plaster came first. I, in, particularly in places like this, uh, places where there hasn't been much building development, yeah. I come across a lot of, of pre-1930 homes that have got gypsum, very weak gypsum plasters onto wooden lath, which the house was built in 1790 or 1760, so obviously the plaster's been stripped off and they've used gypsum pl based plaster but what happens is it's very very it goes brittle very hard uh -huh. so it cracks out really because a wooden wood frame house is br it's moving all the time you know yeah. it's doing this it's constantly moving expanding you know it, 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 the humidity so what happens is the plaster breaks out and then the, the nibs snap off on that contact point where the lath is yeah. so the ceilings or the walls I'm fail the nib, I'm key. key yeah it, well, they fall off basically. So when you when you we'll show you upstairs. I'll go through it this afternoon. So it it sounds hollow because it's basically bouncing. It's just a, it's a sheet of plaster that has no physical attachment 
to what it's on that just bounces up and down on it. And that's in, in terms of, if an architect would say that's failed. You know, that this, you, you now have to figure out how to reattach that plaster to the lath to make sure it's solid. And in particular, on a wall, you know, gravity is good. It works pretty well. Walls will stay up for a long time. If you have a quarter of a ton of plaster on the ceiling and you lose more than one square feet of keys, nibs, the, the ceiling has failed and it could come down at any time and somebody had been hit by a quarter of a ton of plaster from a ceiling. I, I, it's happened to me. I've been hit many times because I do a lot of surveys. It, it might not kill you. It certainly could put you in hospital and it makes you really wary about walking into any other rooms in the building. <laughs> yeah, even with a hard hat on, yeah. It's going to be interesting because it's a bit of a breeze. So apologies to the people that get haired. So basically I just take a little bit like that in between my thumb and finger and tease it out. It's not always so easy with a pair of gloves on. It doesn't really matter if you get some big clumps in there because when you're Try to do this on a non-windy day or inside the building. And just kind of tease it over the surface of the plaster like that. You can actually get also polypropylene fibers which, which um, decorative plastering companies produce. They're, they're, they're okay, they do a good job, but if you're trying to keep the breathability of the plaster, having plastic in there obviously doesn't really... So now, we trap all the hairs in there, like that. And then do the mixing the same way as we did before. It'll go this kind of colour, like a beigey, oh, like light beige, yeah. like a creamy colour. It's a nice colour, actually. And then rinse and repeat. And I, what you're trying to do is get one hair every eighth of an inch, which I'll show you how you check that in a minute, which is what I was taught, which is enough, but you, you can, Again, it's one of those things, if this is a standard, I think two and a half to one mix, so there's two and a half of aggregate to one lime putty. If you wanted something that was really, really sticky, really would cling to anything, you would probably reduce the, the ratio, go two to one or one and a half to one, so one and a half to sand to putty. If you did that, I would over hair the plaster because the moisture leaving the plaster will make it shrink so what you're actually trying to do is reinforce the plaster more by using the hair because the plaster itself is not weaker but more prone to shrink so you'll get a lot of cracks in it and if you didn't over hair it that could lead to failure so the 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 the, the less the ratio the more yeah the more hair you would add, yeah. I try to cut it down to one and a half to two inches because if it's longer than that, trying to plaster with it, you're going to be in trouble with that because you physically can't get the plaster to go through the lath keys. What you should be doing is also checking on the moisture level. You see this is now starting to stiffen up. You can feel it. So I would give it a spray. For me, these are indispensable, just ordinary garden sprayers I get from one of the big box. Yeah. So what I'm doing is I'm looking now 
You see the hair is kind of getting evenly distributed. What I'm looking for is one hair every kind of eighth of an inch. So we're a little bit way off. Mm -hmm. I have to you know, pass it around.